Good morning, Milo. We'll see who shows up today as I likely added a lot of confusion to what time this meeting actually starts. Uh, just to make it more confusing, Milo's gonna, you're, you're gonna be twice. <laughs> Good morning. Twice is good. Good morning, Trent. Good morning. How you doing? Good morning, Marco. Or a good good day. Sorry, I gotta get. I've been trying to get better about being time sensitive to people around the world. Good morning. And if folks can. Sign in, we'll kick this off because I'm not sure how many others are gonna join with the confusion on the start time today, which was totally my fault because it turns out Amy did make the changes and we're just gonna blame COVID. So I think folks don't see the chat session if they uh, if for messages posted before. So I put the link there again. And with Niaz here and the recording going, Niaz, I guess we'll just hand off to you and let you kick it off. Uh, yeah, give me one sec. I'm just updating the pull request. Real time, just in time. Justin won't be here. Speaking of Justin, uh, Justin won't be here this week. He's off this week. So. Yes, yeah, you have that PR that we could put in the notes. It's on NV2 or requirements. Um, let me see. Things. It's in the notary project, the main. Uh, well, under notary, which project? I see an updated key management scenarios, but is that the one that's open? Uh, let's... I put it in the chat. Okay, great. Yeah, requirements. Okay, great. Put those here. So the changes in here are fairly minor, um, but they clarify the uh, distribution workflow that we talked about last time. Um, so I added in some definitions around uh, what a signing key and a root key are, and also clarified the trust or uh, definition, which I think was causing a lot of confusion last time. Uh, and then I used that to kind of uh, add in a section on what the distribution workflow looks like. Um, some of the automated distribution will want to kind of investigate whether tough can be used for that and whether there's any blockers there. Um, but um, let's look at sort of like what the manual workflow looks like um, and see if that's enough for our, like our V1 launch. Do you want to share your screen and do a walkthrough or? Uh, sure, give me one sec.
Uh, I need to change some system preferences. Um, if everyone can start reading it, I'll go ahead and uh, set that up so I can walk through comments. And just for simplicity, I'll, I'll post a link directly to the markdown. Yes, I'm looking through this. Did you cover how keys are acquired? That's what I'm trying to skip through here to find. Uh, it's covered in the uh, uh, signing use cases, I believe. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll let you finish up because I guess if you uh, I talk about. Point. Signing. Yeah. Uh, it's in the larger doc, but might not show up in the differences. Uh, it talks about the steps needed to do it. Um, in terms of like using one key to sign another, there are implementation details that we can walk through as we start implementing it in terms of like the PKCS uh, specific interfaces to use. Uh, but I didn't call out the step-by-step -step process uh, at this point. Okay. Yeah, more uh, what I'm trying to poke on is the how do we establish a, a, a new, uh, I'm trying to find a word for a client that is like clean and pure, like, a, uh, like in a hospital or something. Um, you know, the ephemeral client scenario is what is the way of which we can put content on that in a safe, uh, secure way? So an ephemeral client will still need some configuration to know where it's getting artifacts from, right? Um, as part of that, it can have the trust store configuration. Um, so the trust store is a deployment uh, variable, consider it that way. Uh, at the same time as you're telling it, here's the um, either the uh, registry repository or target that I want you to get, uh, here's also the trust store file that you should use to validate those signatures. So that would tell it what it needs from a validation perspective. Okay, I guess the, uh, my question would be, what is considered a secure way to, to put that there? So, and I'm, I'm trying not to random, you, you, you're trying to change something so you can share your screen and walk through. So I'll let you do that. Um, I think I actually need to quit this call uh, to do that. Uh, okay. You want to call right back? Yeah. Okay. We'll give everybody a chance to read in the meantime.
Same yes. Let me know when you're back and can hear. All right, I'm back. Uh, let me try sharing my screen again. Okay. Great. Uh, is everyone done reading? Should we take a few more minutes? We can do the hand rate. Does this have hand raise? Yeah. All right. Thumbs up when people are ready. Although I think it times out. The key revocations are interesting too. All right, just a time box, we might as well start because we want to get some of the content too. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, I don't see any new comments. Um, I guess um, we can go through some of the definitions and does anyone have any question on the definitions themselves? Not, not um, in general. I mean, I, were these, were, are these just pulled from like the um, notary stuff? I mean, they look familiar. So I'm not sure it's just industry terms or which is good that we're not inventing something new or. Uh, I went with uh, industry terms. Uh, there are some clarifications for the trust store. Uh, I think for um, container signing itself, like you, we are defining what the relationship of the, uh, of the signing material to uh, the source of the material is. Um, 
that's that's I think something that specifically comes in for this, but uh, this is uh, general terminology that we use. Um, for the trust store certificate, I haven't moved into using uh, X509 certificate uh, definitions. Um, that's one where I think uh, we can look at it further down the implementation, whether the X509 format is something we wanna go by uh, or whether um, something along the lines of what Tuff has previously done in, in terms of using multiple JSONs to uh, key certificates or dirty chain certificates is the route we want to go down. So um, that one, I think we can sort out more during the implementation phase. I don't think that disrupts the workflow too much at this point. The only thing that comes interesting with that, and, and I won't pretend to understand the differences between the different key solutions, is the prototype that Shiwei's got us uh, using at this point with the X509 uses the C name to align with the registry and that gives us some interesting benefits. But I understand that at least some of the complications with uh, X509 certs. So it would be interesting to kind of elaborate more on that. And the only reason I'm making it a more of a priority conversation is because the current prototype does use it. Um, so it, it so would be the not necessarily this yeah, I think that's a that's a modification we will want to make where you, using the C name kind of ties you down into getting a certificate from the uh, from the registry itself. Um, and so uh, I think the the route there would be that this is just another configuration. So think of this as like a key pair you're getting from the trust store that says for this uh, location, here is the certificate that I'm going to be trusting. The certificate, really the only thing that the validation mechanism needs to pull out is just the public key uh, and the URL. Uh, the identity is more for the, 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 the administrator to understand um, this is where the key originally came from. Uh, and so really from a validation perspective, the two things that are needed are the public key and the CRL URL. Uh, the CRL URL is essentially to go check what the certificate revocation uh, uh, latest update looks like. Uh, and then the public key is what you're matching with the signature to make sure that that uh, artifact was signed either with that key or with something that changed from that key. So the CRL is how you get the revocation list? Is that how I understand it? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And that's embedded in the key? Uh, that's so embedded in the certificate. In the certificate, sorry, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So how how does that work when the we want to be able to support keys that move between registries? So it, it's originally started in Webit Networks, went to Docker Hub, went into Acme Rockets, and then in the Acme Rocket scenario, then goes into an air gapped environment which always adds interesting challenges. Is the idea that the so CRL, we can, or maybe I'm jumping yeah. in. No, that's actually a pretty good question. Uh, I think I started like I, I that's half a sentence that kind of didn't get finished. I missed that. Um, there is I, I do talk about uh, the air gap environments. Uh, uh, they can specify the trust store, uh, and then you can put in a proxy for the CRL. So you can either download the CRL, make it available locally, uh, at which point it's up to the air gap environment administrator to figure out how frequently they're going to refresh that CRL. Uh, but that that is something we need to address for that you know you aren't going to get up to date information uh, in an air gapped environment and I think that's expected. Okay. At the end of the day, um, uh, you can use CRL proxies uh, within your network um, because the CRL is always going to be signed. Um, so there isn't, uh, I don't think there's a risk there uh, in, in using a proxy within your air gapped environment. So it's kind of a standard model in key management is CRLs can be proxied. Uh, for air gapped environments, yes. Okay. We tend to think of air gapped as being very, um, I was gonna say isolated, which is kind of a goofy way to say it, uh, not common in the submarine kind of scenario is when we start thinking about environments where the average 
large uh, or critical security workload will be air gapped even in a public cloud. Um, is that still kind of scale to that kind of functionality? I guess I'm just, is there something around it that makes it very unique and not often and more complex or does it scale to, hey, probably over the period of time, I don't know, 60% of people that you that are dependent on keys will probably be in an air gapped environment, air gap meaning a, a private VNet that doesn't allow anything outside of it to get, will it scale to that? Um it should. I think it goes back into like how air grabbed environments get managed. Um, something that might come out is that you know people that are operating in air gapped environments with those kind of security controls may already be re-signing all their artifacts, right? They may not trust signatures that are coming from outside as well. So uh, I think there is a mechanism here for air gapped environment operators to decide how they see fit to manage that signature, um, but it it doesn't kind of provide. Um, uh, potentially like alarming and tooling, right? Like air gapped environments could, for example, monitor the CRL externally and, you know, an alarm and take actions whenever that CRL is updated or they see a change to it and then go take a manual action to update their air gap environment. So there's a lot of different ways they could build that business logic, um, but I don't see anything here that would prevent them from coming up with a mechanism to address that. No, that's actually a great point. I mean, I actually like that a lot. It scales in it's, the consistent model we've been thinking about, right? It is, in fact, without even thinking about it, it's what we already have in our workflow. It's Robin Networks publishes something, Docker arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, decides that, hey, this is certified so people can trust it. And then when they bring it into the Acme Rockets environment, Acme Rockets on the, out, on the outside of the air gap environment is evaluating that content again for them and part of that evaluation, it has to have a Wabbit Networks or, or Docker cert certificate on it. And if it does, then it's ingested, it's security scanned, it's tested for their environment. And then it's given an Acme Rockets uh, uh, signature that when in production, they don't care that there's any, the only thing that makes it allowed to go into production is the Acme Rockets signature, not the other one. So if you took that into the air gapped environment, basically what we say is, Outside the environment, yes, they go check on these other keys as part of the ingress, but to get into that environment, there is a secondary stamp that's put on it that says, yes, I trust this. And that update model is maintained so that inside the air-gapped environment, there's no reach outside. It just means that content is constantly flowing into the air-gapped environment, which is this diode model that um, people tend to use. Right, and dialogue meeting only yeah. goes one way. So this is what I'm a little bit confused about because if it seems to me that we're using X509 TLS here, basically, right? Unless I misunderstood something, please, please correct me. But if we do that, then I'm not sure that he can support second, second stamp signatures like that, at least not out of the box. What do you, so elaborate a little bit because I'm confused or if it makes sense to you, Neos. So if I go to if I go to hub.docker.com right now, for example, I don't get two sets of signatures. I only get one. Right, that's part of the problem. That's part of what we're changing. Um, in the too. You'll actually. Uh, yeah, Chishank, I think. What was uh, what are you trying to validate from hub.docker.com? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh, I see. Yeah, let me clarify. So, so Steve was talking about possibly wanting a second set of signatures, right? Sometimes you may want it. May perfectly well be that ninety percent of use cases, eighty percent, is covered by one set of signatures, which TLS lets you do that today, right? So, if I go to hub.docker.com, I know Docker signed for something, and then that's it. I don't get to have Docker and let's say Microsoft both signing for the same TLS connection. When you say TLS, that's correct. You're talking about the connection to Hub itself. Yeah, we should separate the two. I'm not talking about TLS in this case, which I understand, but if we're using the TLS infrastructure, then basically you get one set of signatures at any given time. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned Microsoft in that case, because I, I haven't even, there's, it, there's a bunch of interesting things that get pulled into that. So when the connection, it's interesting. So if you go to Docker Hub, you'll find a bunch of content that there is a catalog that lists the content 
And the URLs actually come from Docker Hub. They, they actually don't say it. There's a default registry name. That's a whole other conversation. But let's just assume that inject docker.io in there. What's interesting is to your point of this connection, when you look for Microsoft content in Docker Hub, actually it all comes from mcr.microsoft.com. So where, now obviously the Docker pull doesn't navigate Docker Hub and read text and decide where it's gonna go. There's, you know, um, but the, the details of kind of what you're getting at is exactly what we're trying to make sure are disconnected, if you will. So Wabbit Networks isn't big enough to worry about hosting their own registry. They like the idea to put it on Docker Hub um, so that they do put it up there, but they're also small enough that most people don't recognize them. So in that case, having two signatures is really important because to your point, I don't know who Wabbit Networks are. I'm not gonna trust that cert. That's like, might as well say bad rabbit. Um, so, but they do trust Docker. So now Docker has a way to differentiate arbitrary public content that bad rabbit puts up there and Wabbit Networks does and Docker says, yep, yeah, they're a partner, we've certified their content and Docker puts a stamp of success on it. Um, at the same token, the Microsoft content, we actually don't even submit the actual images to Docker Hub. We syndicate a catalog to them. Um, all of that is somewhat irrelevant because the best practice is regardless of where the, the public content is hosted, customers should bring that content into their environment where they have control over it. So now there's a copy and they wanna be able to provide their key because it's nice that Microsoft certified it, but we're gonna certify stuff. We're gonna publish stuff that we accidentally, you know, broke somebody, you know, a, a, a well-intended security change uh, on an update will break somebody inevitably. Um, so they should adjust it to their environment, test it, validate it, and whether it's an air-gapped environment or not, put their own key on it. So now that's the third key scenario. Um, I think there, like if you're talking about signatures, right? Um, signatures, you can have multiple signatures. So you're really just looking at what key is configured. So um, in the scenario of like something being moved into an air gapped environment and being re signed, it could still have the original signature, but that's never included in your trust store. So you're just never looking at that in the first place. Um, Shashank, I think uh, for the purpose of TLS validation, were you talking about validating the URLs for CRL or for some other, uh, uh, for something else? Oh, no, 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 not so. Yeah, yeah, I should. So I'm not talking about a TLS connection. I'm talking about the signatures and the metadata. It looks like we're using X509, right? We're borrowing ideas like using CRLs and everything. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is it technically possible to attach multiple sets of signatures to the same content using X509? I'm not, I'm not sure about this. I'm, I'm yes. pretty sure so you can delegate, that. you can say, sorry. Well, we're already doing that in the uh, MV2 prototype. I, it, the way you're asking makes me wonder what would prohibit that. It's just a one-to-many collection. So what, and I know you know this, the this details of security a lot more than I do. So that's why I'm there. There's a reason why you're asking the question and I don't understand the question. Oh, it wasn't clear to me that, that the current prototype supported multiple sets of signatures. I'm very curious about how this works. I'll take a look. I got to check if we've been posting the videos. Yeah, I think X. Sorry. I, I was just going to say uh, just. X5. There's a question of the um, the previous sessions because we're not good about taking notes and we I kind of given up about taking notes. We're just going to point to the videos, but let me make sure the videos are getting posted um, so that people we can refer to these more easily. But we did a demo of it last yeah. week. So X509 is the certificate format. Um, it really just defines what the certificate needs to have to be valid. Uh, it doesn't define the signature format. So you are free to kind of uh, construct your signature uh, in any shape or form you want from an X509 cert. Okay, so basically there's a layer of metadata that NV2 is adding now where you're saying, for example, I can map two different X509 keys to the same metadata. Is that correct? Right, that's correct. 
Got it. So, okay. Uh, Thanks for the explanation. Can, can I ask a question in uh, addition? So the uh, PKI um, keys, uh, X509s, uh, in general, you have the CRLs, which, uh, which basically define which keys are still uh, valid. Uh, so that's the, 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 the TLS infrastructure as we know it today. Um, so the uh, CRL URLs we are talking about is basically an ex extension on top of that, which uh, um, provides the same mechanism on the signature level. Is that correct? Is it I didn't quite understand that. Can you... So uh, let's say if you, you just have your uh, PKI keys, um, which uh, we already know the, the CRL concept. So you, you, you create some keys, uh, you define a CRL that's baked into the key. So the key defines where the CRL is located. And uh, if, if that CRL defines, uh, hey, this key is revoked, then the key doesn't work anymore. But the CRL we are talking about now is on the signature level. So that's, from my understanding, then just an extension on the technology as we know it today from, from TLS. Um, no, your first part is actually more accurate. This is kind of at the certificate level. So uh, when you're defining a certificate in the trust store and also when you're in introducing the certificate in the signature, uh, both of the certificates, uh, if you use the X509 format, would have the CRL. Um, I think we, uh, this is one where I do want to dive into and compare how the uh, tough mechanism kind of compares, which is why we haven't made a decision on whether there should be X509 or not. Um, but the CRL should at least in, it be included in the trust store, uh, if not as well in the signature itself. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, um, the, how, so regarding the, the whole proxy part, how do we prevent uh, a compromise here? Well, let's say I, uh, so, I, I get my access to, to this CRL and uh, I, I know some of these uh, signatures or, or certificates are uh, revoked and I manage to, to modify the CRL and, uh, and put that uh, in place. So that depends on your um, uh, on your TLS controls. So in a in a public setting, in a non air gapped environment, you're relying on CAs to do that validation for you, right? So now, similarly, when you go to an HTTPS site, um, it's how do you recognize that HTTPS site is actually the URL you're looking for? Um, and so that's the mechanism in the public environment. In the air-gapped environment, um, to create sort of like a proxy, you're going to have to set up your own uh, certificate infrastructure and trust uh, a root of trust to kind of say this is this proxy URL is something that I trust instead. Yeah. So is the security of these um, CRLs dependent on the security of TLS and that connection? Uh, yes, in in this in in, in here it does. Okay, yeah, because my concern would be if um, any um, server that was hosting these URLs was compromised, then that would mean the entire signature system would be compromised, right? So there's two factors to it. I think we kind of need to go into a little bit more of the threat model itself. So. Uh, one, the CRL itself needs to be signed. Uh, and so unless you are revoking a root certificate, uh, in which case your CRL, your new CRL, you just don't have a new CRL available, um, the, you, you need to compromise both the signing key and the URL to generate a valid CRL. So just a compromise of one wouldn't necessarily generate a invalid CRL. But so, so like, what is what does the signature sign? It signs the CRL, or it signs. So you for to generate a CRL, I didn't quite go into that, but you need your root certificate to generate the a CRL, right? So your CRL needs to be signed with your root key as well. Okay, but then after it's generated, the it could later be compromised, right? The 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 server hosting the the keys. If the server. 
if the server is compromised, uh, as long as the root key also has not been compromised, it's fine uh, because you can't really generate uh, a new CRL. Okay, I think I understand. I, don't, I just don't understand why it needs to go to a, a third party URL to download it instead of just including the content. It's just to like reduce um, the, the chains. Yeah, it's it's uh, the part of it is to kind of make sure you are getting the most up to date CRL um, that's available. And so, um, if the signature itself contains the the uh, the CRL itself, um, then you could potentially have like you know cert being like a signature being revoked. But if the artifact was like you know it was generated prior to that, it would still not kind of show up as, show itself as revoked, right? So you do need to kind of go to a place where you can retrieve the latest information to get that. So point of clarification, because this is part of this is new to me, so the stupid questions might help provide clarity. Um, today, the way the prototype works is I have a key, I create a signature. The signature goes in the registry. I could create multiple keys. That was the second link I, I think I put in there, or the, either of those two links. Now, when I take an ephemeral client, right, pristine environment, whatever, and I say, hey, I'm trying to pull this image, this artifact, can I get the collection of keys, please? And it brings back a collection of three in our, in our example. My local store, I might have no keys or I might that match, or I might have one or more keys that match. To validate the CRL, the question I'm trying to figure out is I'm going to get back a bunch of signatures from the registry. If I don't have any of those keys locally, do I need to know what the CRL is to go get to figure out whether revoked or it doesn't really matter because I don't have the public keys for those anyway. So my question is kind of baked in does the CRL need to be in the signature we persist in the registry, or does this, or can this, is the CRL just assumed to be on the key? Because until I have the key, then I don't really need to know whether it's revoked or not because I don't have it. And if I to so almost to Mar Mar uh, uh, Marina's point, uh, if I can get a if I get a compromise key. I don't know if I can get a public compromise key, can I? Because if I got a public compromise key, then of course it could put to a different CRL. So I'm kind of confused on that. Yes, yeah, so I, so I, I think, think I, I'm having the same confusion there. Because if if uh, my CRL um, is signed by a key and specifically that key is uh, is leaked somewhere, I, I can modify the CRL. So I think, I'm, I'm not sure. There's but... two. Yeah. There's two factors here, right? Um, you are getting the CRL from a specific URL. So um, you need a compromise of both the URL as well as the signing key for there to be an issue here. And that's like, we're, we're talking about a pretty rare event there, right? Um, well, I mean, usually they're in the same place. So I'm not not sure that that's usually a two separation thing. But, but sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I have a... I think we're getting a bit digressed by the CRL because that's just revocation. Let's just talk about key distribution in the first place and we can talk about revocation. Um, here's what I don't understand. Are we using TLS or are we not? Because if we're using TLS, I don't understand how Steve's three keys get distributed with TLS. It just doesn't work that way. You get one set of keys at any one time. We're not using I, I think TLS. The question so is where the, the keys are coming from and how they're signed, and, and it's. Um, I, I think just as schedules have happened, you've missed when we've done the demos, Trishank. So, I'll, I'm happy to do them again because we'll continue to get new questions every time we look at them, and I'll. Um, I, I would do it now, but with 15 minutes less, Marina wanted to cover something as well, and it would take me a minute to pull up the demo anyway. Um, so why don't we schedule that for next week, next Monday at this time? Totally my fault. Amy did all the calendar changes. It was my fault. At the same time next Monday, I will walk through the uh, latest prototype and we can talk exactly about this. But Trishank, the, the idea is that the keys, the signatures that get posted to an artifact were originated from different URLs to your point if we're using X509, which we're currently using. But I can still get that collection 
from a third, a fourth registry. Like I might have an, a web and network signature that's assigned to it, a Docker Hub signature and an Acme Rocket signature. But honestly, in the production environment, Acme Rockets is gonna have multiple registries and the final production registry will actually be possibly a, a different, uh, not one of the TLS keys from the previous one. So it's, yes, I can go validate the uh, URL that's on it, but that's a secondary verification. And I, as I try to explain it, I don't think I can do justice without doing a demo. So um, maybe it's just, are you available at the same time next week? Um, hard to say right now because I'm going to be traveling, but I will do my best. And yes, yeah, sorry, I haven't caught up with the previous work. No, that no, is no, my bad. I will. No, no, I, there's no, no, everybody's got busy schedules. There's no, no weight put to that whatsoever. It's a total acknowledgement. Thanks. Yeah, right, I, will, so, I, will, I will do my best to attend next week. Okay. And I'm happy to set a one-off to just you and me, but I think others have the same question. That's the only reason why I'm trying to do it at next week's meeting. Okay, so I think we did get a little off. I think we're, we, one of the things we keep on coming back to, and the CRL, the, okay, I don't know if CRL is the exact, the key revocation scenario, which I guess CRLs are part of it, um, or I guess I'm hearing that they are part of it, is a really important scenario, but it's, it's hard to talk about revocation unless we don't know where we're all on solid ground or how we're getting the keys in the first place. So um, maybe that's the place, you know, if you want to, because you, you've obviously put a bunch of thought into it, there's a bunch of great content in here. Do you want to focus on that for now? Well, um, what I'm missing here is kind of what the concern with it right now is, right? Um, like this is something that we kind of see a standard in uh, a lot of the different sort of code signing formats that are out there today, and we know it's proven to work. Um, and so you have two forms. Um, one, like, you know, your URL is something that uh, is signed by a public CA that you're vending a certificate for from a TLS authentication perspective. Uh, this is usually different, um, significantly different from your signing infrastructure that you're using to manage and sign your artifacts. Um, so it generally presents sort of like a, like, you know, you need to take down someone's hosting uh, as well as take down their signing infrastructure to be able to kind of result in a compromise here. Um, this is different from the tough approach where you are, or the notary v2 notary v1 approach where you are managing all your keys as part of notary right um, and so having two different sort of like key mechanisms here um, you do need to compromise both so what i'm missing here is what is the threat model or what is the specific threat um, that we feel like is an issue here that needs to get addressed i think i might have misunderstood earlier but i think that the concern that i have that um just one to think about more than anything is just to make sure that the CRL can't be used to overwrite the existing trusting, trusted keys. I think as long as um, it's just used to evoke them and used to, um, to manage that situation, I think it should be totally fine. And I think, and that's good because it's interesting, right? maybe we put too much weight on what the CRL means, but the, the other thing that I hear constant uh, tension on is this challenge of X509 and, and certs and CA authorities being only available to the people that want to spend the money for it, which is obviously certain ones that would, but we don't want to exclude the rest of the community that also wants and needs to sign something. So even the big companies that want to have lots um, of environments. Um, that wouldn't be an that wouldn't be an issue for X509 certificates. X509 certificate is a certificate format. So you can generate your own X509 certificates from your root keys if you want. It's only if you're getting an X509 certificate from a publicly trusted CA that you're having to pay for it. So uh, whether we use the format or not, I think is uh, doesn't necessarily uh, impose that restriction. Is this the concept of self-signed certs? 
Yes. So you can get a self-signed certificate as your root. Um, that's essentially what the public CAs are doing for you. They have their own self-signed routes that they're giving you intermediates or uh, subordinate keys from. So you can go ahead and create your own self-signed uh, root, share the X509 certificate for that and say, this is the trust, this is the route that I'm going to be using, uh, and then generate your keys off of that. Uh, when we talked about the community use case, we could have registry operators do the same, uh, where they have their own route that they're allowing developers to sign off of. So um, I really wanted to kind of uh, enable this to be more of the tooling and really justify any of the different business use cases for it rather than forcing to one through the implementation. Yeah, it's fair. And just trying to carry the questions that I keep hearing and don't completely understand is I, I hear the tension between X509 being only for the big, which you just elaborated that we can still do uh, self-signed certs and GPG being the more friendly developer thing that anybody could use, which is I assume why uh, the update framework and Notary V1 have adopted it, but I, I may not be doing justice to the conversation. So I think this is a middle ground between allowing enterprises as well as community developers to kind of have a path forward. Uh, with GPG, you still have similar kind of issues where you do need to kind of share your key uh, information publicly as well, like saying, here's the keys that you should trust for my uh, for my entity. So I don't think GPG necessarily takes away um, from kind of providing, uh, from getting rid of that mechanism. Um, but that's something I think like, you know, um, we talked about like whether we want to use X509 or GPG or even some like, you know, the formats that were there in order V1. Um, I'm still not convinced that they impact the workflow, which is what I'd like to get consensus on before we start kind of doing more research and figuring out what are the right formats there. That's fair. I think to a certain extent, the format um, shouldn't matter as long as it includes the fields that we need, right? And if X509 includes the fields that we need, I think that should work. Um, so I guess that, at least for me, that would be the, um, the question is, what are the fields that we need? How do we get those in a format? Right. And I think I called out those in terms of what we need from the trust or perspective. Uh, and then from the signature, really all we need is the uh, is the public key, really, um, uh, and and that's really only uh, the only part that's used. We had an open question around timestamp that didn't uh, that we haven't closed out yet, um, and so besides that, I haven't seen any other um, necessary fields that need to show up in the signature itself. I think if everyone can share comments on this pull request, um, I can take a crack at closing out any remaining questions. Uh, and if I if there's more if there is confusion and certain steps need to get addressed, I'll take a crack at uh, at closing those out. Um, I, I do want to spend some time going through Marina's doc today. Yeah, why don't we, Marina? I don't know. Is nine minutes enough for you to go through with what you had? We can give it a try and then if whatever we don't get to, we can do next week. <laughs> okay, why don't we, uh, all right. So let's just for, for this, you know, let, let's definitely get to a point where you're comfortable because I know we wind up with PRs that stand in PRs forever and we want to get something confirmed that we can then iterate over. So let's figure out how to get it to a point and you know, maybe let's make that a goal. Whatever we feel comfortable with, let's commit this week. And then we can open issues and continue conversations on changes to it. This, this will we have something for reference. Yeah, if we can get some comments on that PR, uh, I noticed some come in already. Um, I'll go ahead and provide some clarifications and then we can uh, look into getting the, uh, the pull request uh, uh, approved. Cool. All right, Marina, it's yours. All right, can you see this? Okay, cool. Um, so um, the, the main idea of this document was just to look through some potential ways to use the kind of the tough workflow with some of the discussion we're using, we're having about notary. Um, one of the big ideas here in this document is how to 
separate kind of the default um, public registry use case and then the private registry use case where we need it to be a little bit more um, client defined, a little bit more specific. Um, and in this document, I also focus on first time clients because I know that that's a big concern, um, especially with like ephemeral clients and other things to make sure that whatever model we come up with still makes sense for those clients. Um, so it doesn't cover everything. It just focuses on kind of those use cases um, for simplicity. Um, so this is that diagram from last week and just kind of in context um, about it. And so I think that the one of the big, I think, open questions, and I think the reasons for collaboration between these different groups is this like step number one in these different workflows is um, kind of the, the things that you need to have ahead of time. And these are the things that you need to obtain through some sort of um, external mechanism, which is, I think, where this whole key management process really comes in and can like coordinate with the tough work because, um, for example, in the the public um, example here using the default um, registry targets metadata, um, the client needs to start with a copy of the trusted root metadata. Um, and this was where in Node Review 1, it was this trust on first use issue, which I think is a big issue, especially for these ephemeral clients. And so um, kind of my tentative idea here is to somehow include this in an out-of-band process, either by shipping it with the client somehow securely or by having a key management solution shift with the client that can then access this trusted root metadata. Um, so this is, I think, one big area. Um, it's not like solved, but definitely one that we should keep talking about and figure out. Um, and this just goes through- is One of the key things, and there's two parts is, it, how does the metadata get created? And does it go across repos that shouldn't have be able to share content? And I don't want to get into that right now, but just like that's part one. But yeah. part two, we keep on waving our hands around. Somehow the client should be able to get this information. And I, and I think that's the part that we really need to figure out. And one of the yeah. things that I keep on hearing is if a registry gets compromised, then I can't trust anything from it. That makes sense. Do we, and I've heard some conversations that talk about, hey, there's two things that a client would get from, because the idea is it, it is less likely, certainly likely, possible, it's less likely, that two things could get compromised. Should Notary V2 have a design that there are two endpoints that somehow are hard to compromise both at the same time? And should the pattern be built around that? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Like, for example, for getting this trusted root metadata, you could have one that's like shipped with the client, however that client is shipped, and then you could have another one that's downloaded from external trusted location, and you can compare those on the first use and say, okay, do these match? If they don't match, you know, something went wrong, and maybe we should reconsider um, trusting this chain. I think there's a lot of really good options. When you get the client, so in other words, I'm going to get a binary that I have to put on the machine, which is fixed, but then there's data that I can acquire at the same time. But I guess yeah, this is just a, this is just off the top of my head. It's just kind of one way you could get that from two locations. Um, but I think getting it from two locations well, in general is a good idea. Um, Sorry, is a two location really needed? I think this goes back to kind of like even when you're deploying an ephemeral client, you're telling it a location to go get things from, right? So um, you do control. Um, what's being deployed to the client in terms of like a configuration, right? Um, and so in that scenario, as part of that uh, push of configuration uh, data, if you're saying here's the trust store that we want to trust, um, what is the concern there, right? Um, that's something I, I think came up in the previous conversation as well, right? Like I think we'll want to understand um, what the threat there or the risk there that is that we're trying to address. Yeah, I think as long as it comes from a trusted like configuration location, I think that's um, a reasonable place to start the chain of trust. I think it depends again on the use cases and threat model, but um, yeah. That is the, the gnarly ball that we're trying to deal with here because when I think of a, an ephemeral client get initialized, yes, it has, it basically gets provisioned with something that says, hey, you have permissions to go to this key store and get information. The idea though that you're getting something from the key store is a piece of data, it is a piece of data, it's a key, that has some time period associated with it is not very short lived, right? There's a certain amount of key rotations, whether it be a year or a month or whatever. But what I hear is this other part is, I wanna get this timestamp metadata and I know if I got rolled back and that 
piece of data is assumed, I'm using the word assume here intentionally, to be rotated or updated much more frequently than a key store probably would be. Now, maybe it's a configuration store. There's a key store, there's a configuration, and then there's the, the actual yeah. artifacts. And that so, timeliness of that update and how, how it can get updated is the interesting problem. Yeah, so I think that that's um, kind of goes into like the next few steps here. Obviously, this number two is just verifying root. Um, but then I think the, the proposal I have is that you then download this timestamp and snapshot from the registry. And these can be updated um, on the registry on some kind of cycle. Um, and this can be like an online automatic process. So nobody has to go and do this every say hour, day, depending on whatever that time frame is. And then um, at the time that the client is ready to download something, they then download that from the registry. And I think in the case of like air gapped environments, you could do something a little bit tricky where you say, you know, you you mess with expiration times a bit and say, okay, instead of did it expire before now, did it expire before like a week from now when I last updated from the, um, the internet or whatever the case is. Um, but yeah, so the basic idea is that this um, timestamp and snapshot would come from the registry, be verified using this route that you got. And then the top level targets, which tells you the uh, actual- this is, I, and I'm, I'm trying to not intentionally interrupt, but it's just, it's one okay. of those where we go past go and we're already operating yeah. at a place where we're not in comfort yet. So this is, my understanding is that part, what makes the timestamp valuable is I'm comparing it with something. So if I'm just getting the current timestamp from the registry, what am I comparing it to to know? Because the assumption is the registry got compromised. So if the registry got compromised, what am I comparing it to to know that yeah. you were compromised? Yeah, sorry. Could, could, I, could I try explaining here a little bit? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, Steve, those, those are good questions. So the first thing, uh, yeah, there's several questions in that. So let me, let me try to answer all of them. The first thing is you got a root metadata, which you're absolutely right about. You need a trusted good copy somewhere, right? And the way we typically solve this, and, and, and the important thing to note about root is that it's not changing all the time. At best, maybe once a year. Once and a year? This thing, usually we solve the problem, even with TLS, by just baking in the root certificates with the operating system or your client, basically. And that can be done today, right? That's not the hardest thing to do. That, that can be solved that way. The important point is that you need to have a secure way to update that root metadata once you've sort of baked it into your client. Because even ephemeral clients are gonna need the binaries package somehow, right? So you can ship in a good copy of the old root that way. The point is to securely rotate the root from there because the server is gonna to try to tell you, hey, let me try to convince you that this is the new root and you should be very, very suspicious and say, whoa, whoa, hold on. Let me check it against the old root. Is there a line of trust from like A to B basically? So hopefully that answers that question. Um, and the second thing, sorry, before I move on, does, does that answer your question? I... Um, there are a couple of things I think there. One, um, I would expect roots to last longer than a year um, to kind of not necessitate the requirement oh, to sure. go yeah, upload right. it as frequently. Uh, and the other one was that um, I'd like to see one where you don't necessarily need that A to B path, uh, because in the event that your current route is compromised, uh, your new route, like you, you, you want an out of band mechanism to say, trust this new route, um, rather than sort of like an automated mechanism. Sure, yeah, that needs to be basically both ways. Um... The out of the out of out of band mechanism has typically been um, nuke the old environment if it's a container and just install the new binary. Um, or the other ways to say, hey, we've controlled the server now. We know we have compromised root keys, but as long as attackers don't control our URL, for example, like you said, example.com, if they don't control it, they can't publish bogus metadata about it. They can put it on another server, but you're not going to use the other server because you're still using the trusted server, you can still use the compromise root keys temporarily to switch over people who don't want to use the out of band mechanism. But as long as there are options, we should be okay. Okay, so we're at time. Um, I'm, here's, here's my thought process. We, these are complicated things, right? We've always known this. 
we know we have the experts in the industry attending these meetings. It's not that we don't have the right people. It's that we're not getting we're not getting the experts from some to get to the other one and get all the pieces connected. Um, and then we don't want to ask the stupid what appears as the stupid question, which I don't usually have a problem asking stupid questions. Um, but we then build and we're getting lost. So here's what I'll suggest. Um, let's take next week, right? We, we've got our weekly meeting. I'll do a demo at the beginning because we said we wanted to do that. But I think we need to just keep on chipping away and building the base that we all agree on and understand. Um, and then we can build on top of that because I, I feel like that's the part where we get disconnected. Does that make sense? Um, I, mean, I I had a quick question. Does everyone mind sticking around till 10, 15? Um, is that, or for another 11 minutes? Yeah, I'm still free. Uh, I, I don't mind. I'm going to die. Um, I had a uh, I had a comment that I think like uh, I'd, I'd want to discuss here to kind of figure out what the next iteration of this doc looks like. Um, the the big thing that I kind of uh, took away reading this is that this is kind of going back into tying uh, the uh, the information that's coming uh, with the with the information that's in the registry and the repository. Uh, and so uh, my assumption from last time was that like you know we would look to see how tough could be reworked to provide uh, key information and not necessarily artifact information right um, I think that allows us to kind of move away um, from a uh, registry uh, dependent model so you could potentially sign something uh, upload it to Docker's notary, but regardless of you know whether you're getting it from Docker's repository or not, uh, a registry or not, you can get it from any other place, and you can still reach out to the uh, 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 the Docker sort of like hosted version of uh, Tough, if you will, to validate your keys. Um, so that was something that um, I think created some confusion for me from like steps four to seven. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess kind of two two answers to the question so first of all the um so basically when i was looking at it that what i kind of um realized was there's certain there are certain properties that you definitely should just you can just chain to to access the keys to then access the artifacts the problem is that there's also a few a few security properties that you can't achieve just through the signing keys on the individual um artifacts and so for those properties things like rollback protection, things like timeliness, um, consistency, um, all those kinds of things. Um, you need kind of something on the registry as a whole. And so my kind of idea was to split these two, to have all, the registry as a whole has a root, which has the timestamp and the snapshot, which ensures those properties for the whole registry. And then the client has an option to have a different chain for getting their, um, their trusted top level targets, which then chains to to access the signatures for the individual um, metadata files. And so in like this second workflow where they're using a client defined um, top level targets, um, they still, they, they um, where is it? So starting at step like five through seven, the, this, is, this is a whole chain of keys that just comes from what the client decided they wanted to trust. Um, and just these keys. Yeah, the rollback protection. Yeah, I think that's that um, we discussed this earlier um, in the key management group, right? Like, we didn't want to use signatures as a mechanism for preventing rollback, uh, uh, preventing rollbacks, because there are a lot of valid scenarios where um, you want to roll back to an earlier trusted artifact. Um, and we wanted to kind of ensure signature validation as more a mechanism of saying, can you trust this artifact or not? Uh, and rely really more on revocation as a mechanism of saying that trust has been revoked and ro don't roll back to this specific version, right? Um, and so I think here kind of what I was expecting from the tough framework to say was here's your latest set of revoked keys that you should not be trusting, or here's your latest set of uh, signatures that you shouldn't be trusting, rather than saying, here's the latest artifact and don't trust anything else before that. 
Yeah. That's and actually a great. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Question, I, the one thing I think. Something uh, important there. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to because he touched on something really interesting. I hadn't really thought of before that. If I if an image, an artifact, an artifact ships something on Monday, and then it's signed with key one, and on Wednesday they and they ship a new thing, it's still signed with key one, and they realize on Thursday that Wednesday's release was broken. They want to roll back to Monday's release. As long as Monday's release, the thing they're rolling back is still the same key and the key wasn't revoked, that should be a valid scenario, which somewhat feels in conflict with the stuff that I've heard Tuff talk about in the past of, we actually don't want to enable that because yes, it is valid, but it has some vulnerabilities into it that are known and it's fine, but we don't want the thing, the current to be rolled back. So it kind of feels in conflict with each other. Yeah, so the um, the snapshot metadata, I think traditionally in TEF does include all of the different artifacts on the on the you know registry repo, whatever you want to call it. But um, the another thing that it includes is the ver is the the current version of all of the um, signatures and all the like all the metadata, all the targets metadata that's on the registry. And so um, that means that if you want to remove, like say that you know this. Um, you know, this metadata should no longer be trusted because, you know, we realized that this release was bad. You can move that from the registry and then make sure it also gets removed from the snapshot metadata so that anyone who downloads that snapshot knows that um, that file is no longer valid. So if they get that file, they know that, you know, something went wrong and they shouldn't necessarily trust it. And I think we can work with what exactly should be included in that snapshot. And maybe it shouldn't be artifacts. Maybe it should just be the metadata about artifacts to, to keep track of, you know, what should be trusted um, right now. Doesn't it still keep the dependency on the um, uh, on the registry in terms of like where you're getting your artifacts from, though? Um, a little bit. So the for the snapshot and timestamp that would be dependent on the registry, and those would have to be generated by each registry, but then the whole targets chain could be copied between registries. But that still requires you to copy things between registries, right? I think one of the key requirements we had um, was to make sure that you can move artifacts from one registry to another uh, and still be able to validate signatures through that. Um, and you shouldn't have to go back to the other registries to validate. Oh yeah, definitely. So as soon as it gets moved into the registry, the registry can automatically generate those those files, and then the the rest of it will, will just be already trusted by the client. Especially Each in this model. Has its own metadata for uh, timestamps and so forth. Yeah, so it's just this timestamp snapshot that the registry has to generate. The other stuff is transferable. Right. I think, but that goes back into like, at this point, are you trusting the registry or are you trusting the original um, signer, right? Um, because now the registry is generating all this information for you. So I think this, the, the part that kind of caught me here is that it seems like, you know, some of the things we had discussed in the, uh, in the signing architecture, uh, we're revisiting here in this doc. Um, and, uh, my question is that like, you know, do we not have consensus on the signing workflow and what we're validating there then? I don't think we have consensus on the workflows. That's part of why we're having the conversation. So that's part of what we're trying to get agreement across the varied parties with that have the expertise so, of the background. So all these are very good questions. And I think, I think here's a way forward. Here's what I propose and you guys can push back. Feel free to push back and tell me what you think. But I think we don't necessarily need to agree here, provided different people, as long as we can agree on the basics, like everyone basically wants artifacts to be signed by developers, right? For example, like this is a basic minimum requirement. Fantastic. I think as long as we can provide options to like say NV2, tough version of NV2 to like optionally validate timestamp snapshot metadata, as long as there's a way for it to be able to do that, then I don't think it should matter to any other implementation. What do you guys think? I think there's an assumption that the top workflow works for registries where content's moving between registries that I don't think we've come to a conclusion on yet. 
So it's not that we want to preclude something, but we do want to say that the signing solution we're putting into registries we can stand behind and it supports the scenarios we've outlined in the requirements stuff. Well, I think, uh, Trishank, another point there is that, you know, um, we are trying to, I think, agree on a basic signing scenario, like workflow uh, that says, here's how you have developers, you know, uh, sign their artifacts, and this is how the signature gets validated, right? On top of that, if we're looking at Tough as a mechanism for a key distribution uh, for developers that they can use, um, for that to be successful, um, I think one of the things that we would want to consider is how do we make the signature scale across repositories, right? Uh, and if we have a limitation there that says if a registry does X, Y, and Z, or if this is kind of part of the default implementation, um, then it addresses, uh, I think it, it creates friction for that adoption. On the flip side, um, if those are optional, um, I think there is a path forward, but um, I think we'd want to question like, you know, what, how are those optional fields being maintained? Who are the operators and what value does that provide? Um, the, the issue I have is that we want to cover the base case first and have agreement there before we move to the optional requirements. Um, and so if we do we I, the question first is like you know do we have a, a consensus on here's how we wanted the basic signing workflow to go and I don't think we have that yet uh, and then here are the optional use cases that we'd want to address through like Tough or SBOM or through some other places right um, and that's the part that I think you know we uh, we may be going a little bit in circles um, and so I would say let's close the base use case first before we start going into the optional use cases. Yeah, I think my concern would be that if we design the base use case in such a way that it makes the optional use cases impossible, we'll have to just revisit it anyway. Well, I think I, 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 we go ahead. certainly recognize that Tuff has got a lot of great work in it, and that's why we continue to have these conversations. So just we're not, I don't think we're at connecting all the pieces yet, and we just don't want to be in that spot where the pieces just don't connect and customers are just confused. This doesn't, this is kind of like all browsers share a way to do a security model. And, and maybe I'm not using the right analogy here, but we need to make sure that as content moves between registries, which they have to be successful, that we all share a common model. You can't constantly be doing adaptations between registry one and registry two. Um, so that's, that's why we're kind of pushing on this core standard, not that it couldn't evolve, but there has to be a standard way when I pull an image from Docker Hub and I move it to Web Acme Rockets that it will just work. It doesn't matter where Acme Rockets hosted in AWS, Google, Azure, on-prem, uh, you know, somebody else with uh, JFrog or Harbor. They should all have this core piece in it. Yeah, and I, I just don't understand where this wouldn't be able to do that. And that's a great question to carry to our next meeting because we're now 15 minutes past and I, I moved this other meeting so I can stay. So let's let the conversation continue. Okay, we'll, we'll continue next week then. Thanks everyone. Okay. Right. Thanks folks.